It's not only one of the most daring airstrikes in modern history, it was also carried out with near surgical precision. Dubbed Operation Opera or Operation Babylon, Israel's bombing of Iraq's nuclear facility in 1981 was intended to eliminate the possibility of Saddam Hussein developing nuclear weapons at last resort to a potential global threat. Today we're going to cover every aspect of this controversial mission, the assassinations that preceded it, the expert planning and execution of the airstrike, and the strokes of luck that made it all possible. Our story begins in the early 1970s, when Iraq was under the de facto control of Saddam Hussein. Saddam had big plans for the nation under his rule, and planned for Iraq to one day be a great regional power, stronger than Egypt, stronger than Iran, and most importantly, stronger than Israel. And what better way to achieve this than through the development of nuclear weapons? The only issue was that if Iraq started a nuclear weapons program, it would almost certainly be detected by the likes of the United States and the Soviet Union, who would likely put an end to such a threat. This meant that if Iraq was going to head down such an atomic path, it needed to be purely under the guise of scientific research and energy production. And so in the 1970s, Saddam began shopping abroad, looking to purchase a nuclear reactor. Long ago, Iraq had purchased a rather small reactor from the Soviet Union, one only capable of producing two megawatts. But now, armed with loads of cash, Saddam hoped that he could score a bigger one. Unfortunately for him, the USSR denied his request, and he was outbid in a couple of other purchases. But finally, in 1975, France agreed to sell Iraq a 40 megawatt Osiris class research reactor, which they named Osirak, along with 72 kilograms of enriched uranium, all for a cool $300 million. At this point, Israel was already becoming quite aware of Iraq's plans. After all, despite Iraq signing the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, essentially promising to never invest in nuclear arms, as well as agreeing with France that the reactor would have no military purpose, intelligence reports claimed that Saddam was still looking to weaponize the atom. However, this task would become even more difficult once Saddam reluctantly agreed to let personnel from the International Atomic Energy Agency inspect the plant and install cameras. But it would still have been possible. Perhaps the plan was to eventually convert the reactor to produce plutonium, or perhaps the plan all along was to build a domestic copy of the foreign reactor, or once they had their hands on it, one that would have no international ties and no inspections. This was all a terrifying prospect to Israel, and they strongly opposed the purchase, even directly announcing, from sources whose reliability is beyond any doubt, we learned that this reactor, despite its camouflage, is designed to produce atomic bombs. They tried to convince the UN to block the purchase, and tried directly persuading France to cancel the deal, but all to no avail. And so, when their diplomatic attempts failed to stop the transaction, the task fell to the hands of Mossad, Israel's national intelligence agency, and they were prepared to thwart the reactor in a not-so-diplomatic way. The first of these covert missions came in April 1979, when allegedly Israeli agents placed in France managed to locate the warehouse containing the first of many shipments destined for Iraq and promptly blew it all up. An organization known as the French Ecological Group stepped up and took responsibility for the explosion, but suspiciously, no one had heard of them before and they haven't been heard from since, so it's pretty evident who was really behind the whole thing. The bombing had destroyed enough material to delay the shipment for another six months, which sounds like a success, but it wasn't the permanent solution that Israel was looking for. A year later, though, they kicked things up a notch. In 1980, the Egyptian nuclear scientist Yahya al-Mashad, who was in charge of Iraq's nuclear program, rejected a shipment of French uranium because he claimed it did not meet the proper specifications. France apologized for the inconvenience and invited Mashad to fly in and personally inspect the next shipment before sending it to Iraq. Mashad agreed and would soon spend some time in Paris testing fuel rods and certifying their quality. Once everything was back in order, Mashad purchased a ticket for a return flight home, but unfortunately, he would never make it on the plane. When he returned to his hotel for the night in Paris, he was assassinated by Israeli agents, who slit his throat and left his body on the bed, which was discovered by a maid the following morning. The only potential witness to the murder was a prostitute known as Marie Express, who was mysteriously killed in a hit-and-run accident a week later. That same year, Israel was suspected to be behind several more bombings and sabotage operations to slow down the construction of the reactor. But despite their best efforts, the project moved forward, and soon it was discovered that the reactor could be operational in just a few months. With all other options seemingly exhausted, the Israeli cabinet voted 10 to 6 in favor of forcibly disabling the reactor. If they waited any longer, bombing an operational reactor could spread radioactivity into Baghdad. They had to act before it was too late. 
While Israel's top brass began drawing up plans to strike Osirak, the whole situation always suddenly flipped on its head. In 1980, Saddam Hussein invaded Iran, sparking a horrific and deadly war that would ultimately last for eight more years. But this now meant that Iran and Israel had a common enemy, and the two began working together to destroy the reactor. Just after the onset of the war, Iran made the first move on the plant, sending in two F-4 Phantoms under codename Operation Scorch Sword. These jets made it to the site, which was just south of Baghdad, and dealt extensive damage to the control rooms and the research laboratory surrounding the reactor, but they failed to damage the core of the facility. Following the attack, the skies between Iran and Iraq were now too heavily guarded for a follow-up strike, meaning it was now Israel's turn to swing, but such an attack would be far trickier for the Israeli pilots. The biggest issue was the distance. In order to reach the reactor, the fighter jets would need to take off from an airbase in southern Israel, cross over the southern tip of Jordan, an enemy nation, and then fly across Saudi Arabia, another enemy nation, before entering Iraq. Once finally in Iraqi airspace, they would need to cross the majority of the country to reach the reactor before dropping their payload. The distance to the target alone meant that the F-16s recently acquired from the United States would have to be equipped with external fuel tanks, making the planes heavier and less maneuverable. And because the mission involved flying deep through enemy territory, the pilots would need to fly low to the ground to avoid being detected by radar, as well as only speak in Arabic and mimic foreign flight formations. Once they arrived at the target, they would need to execute the bombing runs with absolute perfection, evade the enemy anti-air fire and interceptors, and then somehow make the return flight home. All in all, the mission was more reminiscent of the desperate plan to destroy the Death Star in Star Wars Episode 4, and just like with the Rebels, there wasn't much of a guarantee that the Israeli pilots would survive such a risky operation. Over the coming weeks, the entire mission was planned out to the exact moment. The best Israeli pilots were recruited for the mission, and soon they began training over the Mediterranean to replicate the distances and altitudes required for the mission. An imitation Osirak plant was constructed through leaked information, giving the planners insight into its weakest points, and Iran supplied aerial photography of the target during some risky reconnaissance missions. Special training was also given to the mission team by American pilots, who flew practice runs with the Israelis over the desert in Utah. Finally, after months of preparation, everybody was ready and the green light was given to execute the airstrike. Operation Opera was now in motion. On the 7th of June 1981, the eight F-16s were geared up for the mission, each carrying sidewinder missiles and a pair of 2,000-pound unguided bombs, bringing the fighters well above the recommended weight for the airframe. At 3.55 p.m., they began taking off, struggling to get airborne, though they managed to do so just before reaching the end of the runway at Etzian Air Base. Following the F-16s was a squadron of six F-15s, ready to provide fighter support should the need arise. Once in the air, the jets flew south, crossing briefly into Jordanian airspace and crossing the Gulf of Aqaba. Then, when they were contacted by Jordanian air controllers, the pilot spoke Arabic with a Saudi accent and explained that they were merely a Saudi patrol that had gotten off course, backed up by their Saudi flight formation. This worked like a charm, and they continued on their path. However, by sheer coincidence, the entire operation was almost thwarted as soon as it began. Vacationing in the Gulf of Aqaba was the King of Jordan, Hussein bin Talal, who looked up from his yacht and spotted the Israeli fighters flying overhead. Once he saw their Israeli markings, how heavily armed they were, and the direction they were flying, he immediately deduced that the Osirak reactor was in trouble and ordered his government to send a warning to Saddam. However, due to a failure somewhere in the communication chain, this message never made it to Iraq, which saved the mission. Not knowing that they'd just narrowly avoided a total catastrophe, the pilots pressed on and crossed into Saudi airspace. This time, they flew in a Jordanian formation, spoke Arabic with a Jordanian accent, and explained to Saudi air controllers that they were just a Jordanian patrol that had got a little lost. Remarkably, this also worked like a charm, and they continued on their way, having deceived both nations. By now cruising over the sand dunes of Saudi Arabia, the heavy F-16s had already burned through so much fuel that the external tanks had been emptied and the pilots jettisoned the depleted tanks to make the aircraft lighter. This was a risky move, and the pilots later described the uncertainty that the fuel tank could have scraped one of their bombs while detaching from the wings, but fortunately it all went smoothly and the empty metal casings fell into the Saudi sand, never to be seen again. Once the jets had reached Iraqi airspace, the real challenge began. All but two of the F-15s split up from the main group, dispersing and hoping to act as a distraction, while the F-16s dropped their altitude all the way down to below 30 meters or 100 feet. 
soaring across Iraq's desert under the radar, uh, they would need to remain at or below this altitude until they reached the target and maintained strict radio silence to avoid detection. Once Os Iraq was near, the squadron went into a sharp climb, reaching 2,100 meters or 6,900 feet, before going into a 35 degree dive aimed at the reactor. It was at this point that they expected to be intercepted. But it turns out that their arrival time was absolutely flawless. Just a half hour earlier, the Iraqi guards manning the anti-aircraft guns and surface-to-air missiles had left their posts to eat dinner. And due to a stroke of luck, the technicians had, for some reason, turned off the radar as well. This meant that there were no enemy fighters in the air to contend with, and the reactor was nothing more than a sitting duck. As they continued their descent toward the target, the lead pilot, Zeev Raz, realized that he had misjudged his angle of attack and would miss the dome over the reactor. Fortunately, the lack of enemy resistance allowed for some corrections to be made, and as the second jet took the lead role, Raz pulled his fighter in a loop, falling further back in line, now on track to hit the mark. Pair by pair, the unguided bombs were dropped in five-second intervals, sent plummeting toward the reactor below. As the first bombs hit, the Iraqis sprinted to their positions and started firing their anti-air guns, but it was all too late. Each F-16 successfully dropped both of its bombs, and it's estimated that at least half of the 16 struck the center of the reactor, causing irreparable critical damage, while the rest hit various wings of the facility. After successfully evading the anti-aircraft fire, the squadron reformed, climbed to a high altitude, and began the flight home, this time taking the shortest, most direct route to Israel. A few surface-to-air missiles were fired at the jets as they departed, but none of these were able to find their targets, and the pilots left Iraqi airspace unscathed. The next, the entire attack had lasted less than two minutes, and Iraq didn't have a chance to scramble a single fighter of its own. Saddam was so enraged with the failure of his armed forces that he ordered the execution of Colonel Fari Hussein, who had overseen Iraq's western air defense zone. Not only was he executed, but also all officers under his command above the rank of major were too. In addition to the aforementioned death sentences, 23 Iraqi pilots were imprisoned for failing to get into the skies during the attack. The Israeli pilots, on the other hand, would return home and be lauded as heroes, and personal letters of gratitude from government officials were even presented to the pilots for their various roles in the mission, and they would all go on to have distinguished careers. Ilan Rahman, who was the youngest of the crew, aged just 24 at the time of the operation, would later become Israel's first astronaut, though would ultimately lose his life in the 2003 Columbia Space Shuttle disaster. It would be an understatement to say that news of the airstrike came as a shock to the rest of the world. The US government was completely caught off guard and had absolutely no idea that Operation Opera had been in the making. It would later be described as a serious intelligence failure to not detect such a massive operation, and a special investigative team was even tasked with ensuring that this wouldn't happen again. Speaking about Israel's Prime Minister, President Ronald Reagan later said, He should have told us and the French. We could have done something to remove the threat. Speaking of the French, they were pretty upset about the attack as well, especially considering that among the 10 casualties at the facility, one of them was a young French technician. They also asserted that the plant had been purely scientific in nature, a sentiment backed by the UK, who also believed that Iraq was nowhere near the capability to produce atomic weapons. Indeed, the International Atomic Energy Agency stated that their latest inspections had revealed nothing but compliance and nothing to suggest ulterior motives within the plant. The UN Security Council immediately responded with a unanimous vote to condemn the attack, followed by the UN General Assembly, who called on Israel to pay back the damages caused to Iraq. On the other hand, Israel continued to maintain their position, claiming that they had set back Iraq's nuclear program an entire decade and were acting out of self-defense. An opinion seemingly vindicated in hindsight when Saddam Hussein invaded and annexed Kuwait ten years later, sparking the Persian Gulf War when the United States and allies intervened. The Gulf War was an incredibly bloody conflict, but from the perspective of Operation Opera, there's a chance it could have been much worse. As explained by political science professor Luis René Barres, had it not been for the brilliant raid at Os Iraq, Saddam's forces might have been equipped with atomic warheads in 1991. So, on one hand, we can describe Operation Opera as a brilliant success that thwarted Saddam's nuclear plans, a mission that, despite being condemned the world over for its aggressive nature, was a necessity to maintain regional and global stability. On the other hand, we have the opposite opinion. The idea that Operation Opera did nothing but accelerate Iraq's nuclear program. Israel had wagered that such an airstrike would be under the threshold of starting a war with Iraq, as Saddam was probably going to be too busy with his war in Iran to open up another front. 
This was a good bet, and it's true that Iraq didn't retaliate. However, they seriously underestimated Saddam Hussein's determination to proceed with a nuclear program and drove him even further into his anti-Israel stance. Just after the attack, Saddam is reported to have said, once Iraq walks out victorious, there will not be any Israel. Much of this was revealed in a 2003 interview with an Iraqi nuclear scientist named Kidir Hamza, who fled to the United States in the 1990s. He stated that after the airstrikes, Saddam increased the nuclear personnel from 400 to 7,000 and invested an additional $10 billion. The whole operation was simply moved into utmost secrecy, and enriching uranium became the top priority, with Israel now being the number one target. He claimed that had the proposed facilities been completed as planned, they would have had the ability to produce as many as six atomic warheads per year. Fortunately, these were never completed, with progress having been set even further back by a second and third bombing of Osirak by the United States during the Gulf War. So, as counterintuitive as it might seem, it's possible that Israel's reactor raid triggered the very program that it was intending to destroy. Put best in an article by author Malfred Braut Heghammer, the destruction of the Osirak reactor did not delay the development of a nuclear weapons option because it was never intended to be a part of such an effort. On the contrary, it brought about a far more determined and focused effort to acquire nuclear weapons. The whole controversy shines an uncomfortable spotlight on the military doctrine of preventative attacks. After all, if such strikes only increase the danger in the long term, is military action really the best option? It's sort of a damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario. Or perhaps Israel should have waited for more verifiable intelligence instead of jumping the gun without international support. The whole ordeal seriously damaged Israel's international reputation. We may never know the true repercussions of Operation Opera. Maybe it did save the region from a rapidly advancing Iraqi nuclear program. Or maybe all it did was drive an already dangerous dictator to his volatile limits, ultimately intensifying decades of instability in the Middle East. Regardless, there's no denying the preparation and skill that pulled off one of the most complex and daring airstrikes ever attempted.